this morning's docket. And it's case number 104485, State of Kansas v. Jose Santos Vega. Could you make your appearance by the microphone, Sorry. please? Thank you. Sorry. Uh, may it please the court, the appellant appears by Michael Barty. I would like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal, if I may. Three minutes is granted. Um, I raised seven issues in the brief, and I'm simply going to stand on the arguments um, in some of these. Issue number one was the alternative means argument that I made, and I think the, the Brown case decided by this court has disposed of that argument as far as Kansas law is concerned. Uh, the same holds true for issue number five, which is the disproportionality of life sentences uh, in Jessica's law cases, so I'll stand on the brief on issue five as well. And uh, I believe issue six and seven have been conceded by the state, and those refer to a couple orders that the district court entered at the time of sentencing. Uh, so I'm going to focus on issues two, three, and four. Uh, two is the multiple acts jury unanimity instruction, um, or the lack of that instruction, actually. In this case, um, we had two counts of indecent liberties and two counts of rape charged on two separate victims. Um, there was an acquittal as to the rape charges on the second victim. The, the, the alleged victim whose testimony was the basis for these convictions was ST. Um, ST testified about three incidents. There were statements brought in from other witnesses who differed in some aspects from what ST had testified occurred. Um, Those witnesses were just repeating what she had told them, right? Well, more or less, yeah, yeah with, with some deviation in the stories. Um, but, but we end up with three instances of this indecent liberties alleged by the complainant in the case, and we end up with two charges. So we end up with three incidents because of the consistent testimony of the victim, correct? I mean, she said this happened each of th three successive right. days. Right. And, and what I want you to focus on for me is the difference between uh, the Voiles case and Foster. Because Voiles, you had several different witnesses providing different testimony that then inferred a bunch of different incidents, 20 or some different possibilities of the charges. In Foster, we had the victim saying she was raped twice, but only one charge. And this case to me seems to be more like Foster than it does to Voiles because the victim is saying there were three incidents. None of the other witnesses add any other incidents, so we don't get more than three. And so I don't see where the confusion is. I mean, I think well, the, the state concedes this is a multiple acts case. So we're really down to, you know, what to make of it. And so, I, I guess, draw a distinction between this case and Foster. Well, which, I mean, the big question for us is which two acts did the jurors find? But Foster uh, says that's not the determining discussion because the victims consistently said there were three incidents. And there's no real dispute that, for example, because some other witness said, well, she talked about a different day and a different thing, so now we got a fourth or something. We don't have to believe different people. This case seems to boil down to do you believe the little girl or do you believe the defendant who said nothing happened ever? Well, I, so you see my point? I mean, I, it doesn't do, make a difference I'm, that there were two incidents but only one charge necessarily. And I'm, I'm trying to recall if some of the other witnesses had, if their inconsistencies went to the number of incidents, which I don't know. Okay. Um, the real basis for what I'm arguing, I think, is based more on Allen, which was two possible acts into one charge of marijuana possession. Um, How does which, the jury question factor into that 
Well, it tells us it tells us the jury was wondering about it because they said there have been you know there are these three things charged or these three things discussed and two things charged. Why? What does that mean? And that's what did the state's response do in that respect? Well, it it didn't do anything to solve the problem that I'm arguing. It simply said those I think it was those are the charges. You know, there are let's see. I quoted it in my brief what the response was, but it was really not something I would call helpful on the issue. I think the answer was there are four counts. Even though there may have been testimony of additional acts. And I think that may that may answer the previous question about the number of acts. There are only four crimes. The defendant is charged with four crimes, the elements, and refer them back to that. Does the defense bear some responsibility when the court said this is my proposed answer and the defense didn't propose anything else? Well, I think it affects the standard of review, which I think I've really incorporated into the argument. You know, I think the standard of review would be tougher if the defense had objected. It may be more lenient toward us, but I still think this is error under the case law, even without that objection. Nobody proposed the multiple acts instruction. Nobody thought about it. And somebody should have thought about it at that point. The jurors were actually thinking about it, I think, and wondering what this meant. We simply have three acts into two charges. And this is this was a close case as cases go. There was not really physical corroboration. There were no eyewitnesses. There were inconsistencies in what ST testified to over time and between some of her statements and the statements of corroborating witnesses. So I think given the weakness of the evidence and the jury's own concern about how to evaluate three charges into two possible crimes of conviction, it was error for the court not to have given the multiple acts instruction and instructed them specifically. You're going to have to agree on which acts constitute those crimes that you're finding Mr. Santos Vega guilty of. The next issue is issue number three, and that was Detective Hudson's violation of the limiting order, which was sought, which addressed this specific issue. So we've got Doyle. We've got all those cases that tell us that it is improper to introduce evidence of and comment on a criminal suspect's invocation of his rights. But on top of that, we've got a specific order in limiting that was entered in this case. And it's not clear, as I recall, whether they got into whether the prosecutor told the detective of this order. But it's pretty common knowledge for police that they're not to introduce evidence of people's invocation of their rights, especially when they embellish it with a description of the guy casting his head down and mumbling something or speaking that he wanted an attorney to create the impression that the defendant was guilty. He was clearly guilty. He was acting guilty in his physical language. I have a couple of questions about this. I think maybe three questions. I'll try to keep them in mind as I go through each one. The state makes an argument that defense counsel should have cut off the detective mid-answer in order to shut that down and that somehow that that's invited error. What's your response? I mean, frankly, the way I read the transcript, I have a little trouble with that argument. I'm not trying to give it credibility, but I do want to more specifically get your response to it. Well, yeah, I guess, you know, he could have. You know, there's also this aspect that you ask a fair question, somebody picks it up and gives a non-responsive answer. When you dive in in front of a jury, who knows what's going to happen? The judge may have cut it off. That's not clear. 
I don't see invited error by asking a a fair question somebody starts talking and not jumping up and interrupting I just don't know that do you think it's reasonable for that the court seemed to say when I was looking at it seemed to agree with the state that the question sort of prompted this additional information what's your response to that it it wasn't the best question ever because there was some aspect of open-endedness to it to what I think it was what information you had when you did your affidavit but Hudson went beyond answering that question he could have said you know we had the claims from ST and I didn't have the defendant statement something along that line is getting getting close to this problem and not there but he didn't stop there he just he just kicked the door down your client refused to make a statement and then we get into the body language of how he refused to make a statement that was just non-responsive to the question so you know I don't from reading this it looks to me like Hudson decided he was going to make this case in that answer despite the question he was not asked that for that information he took it on himself to do that and let's say he did let's say we find that we we agree with your position here what's what's the result of that well I just it's hard for me it was a single instance as the court pointed out it wasn't highlighted but it was violated what's what's the what's the remedy here I think the remedy has to be a new trial and why it's a bell that cannot be unrung and there was no remedy you know this happens they do the council approach thing the defense asked for a mistrial it was denied there was no admonishment to the jury to disregard that state defense didn't ask for and for any kind of curative instruction they asked for a mistrial they didn't receive it and I think at that point the defense has asked for something has asked for a remedy the strongest remedy they could get there I think at that point it may fall on the the judge to say all right I'm gonna temper this at least with some remedy with some admonishment because it shouldn't have happened and that didn't happen here it's you know you request a mistrial that's denied and then we move on in Galloway which is another case that involves some detective John Hudson or whatever his first name is from Wyandotte County doing an incredibly similar thing he said something about he was acting crazy he just got up said he just got out of prison for murder the court said disregard that it's not true so there was at least some correction of that error it gave a written instruction also to the jury when it returned the jury instructions to the jury and on appeal the court found it we didn't appear to be an intentional act I think this one was I just does that make me get back to Justice Rosen's question I've had problems trying to figure out from your brief what standard you want us to use here is this a do we review this as a denial of a motion for mistrial is it prosecutorial misconduct because you talk about ill will and all that you know is it the denial of a is it a statutory violation because it's a motion in limine so I have trouble figuring out where you're landing I did argue it kind of as both it's 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 a violation of an order in limine clearly it's it's maybe a Doyle violation I mean I it is as far as the officers concerned there's not argument made by the state and on the the aspect of prosecutorial misconduct I did that in the sense that I think the state and the police are a team especially when there's a motion and limine that's been granted and it's incumbent on a prosecutor to explain to the witness what that witness is not allowed to go into and I couldn't tell if that happened here and don't we usually require the party to make a record of that to have an in-camera conference where the prosecutor is asked what steps they took well after the 
after the after fact? The, after the well, violation, to, in order to make the argument that it was prosecutorial misconduct, doesn't the record have to be developed for that? Well, if with the the approach I'm taking, which is that the state either did that or didn't, we don't know. Um, but I think Hudson is essentially on the state's team. I mean, I, you know, I, I know it's not quite prosecutorial misconduct because the prosecutor didn't do this um, and didn't and didn't really argue it. But I think if, if we lift some of those elements from that analysis and plug them into these facts, if we if we make the state responsible for Hudson's <clears throat> conduct after an order in limine, I think at that point we're reaching prosecutorial misconduct if we view them as a team. Um, and the rest of the elements it was flagrant and gross. Um, does it show ill will? Well, you know, either the state got this order in limine and didn't tell its witnesses about it or told its witness and the witness whose conduct is attributable to it simply ignored it um, and went after Mr. Santos Vega with about the most damaging evidence that can be introduced. But there's nothing in the record that we can look at because no record was made well, by, de by defense counsel that right. would allow us to say the prosecutor knew he set up Detective Hudson this demonstrates gross and flagrant conduct or it's ill will. We just don't know what happened. Is that right? Right. And that's why I'm arguing those, those two prongs. I mean, it, it's a deal where either the prosecutor knew it and didn't, and didn't tell his or her witness or his or her, her witness working for the state was told and just decided to ignore that order. I mean, it's, it's got to be one of those two. But part of your argument, it seems to me, is judge... I got an order in limine prohibiting this conduct. The order was violated, and I then asked for a mistrial. It was not granted, so I'm done. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair statement? I think that's what happened here. I, I, I think he raised it in a motion for a new trial, but I don't know that it reached the, the recreation of what had occurred. Um, and who knew what and whether the prosecutor actually told Hudson about that order. But I, I think Hudson's actions are attributable to the state. How do we, um, how do we factor in the extensive questioning that defense counsel did after the motion was denied uh, of the detective about all of this, including, I mean, there, there's a, I counted up at one time, but I can't remember. There's 10 or 12 questions and answers about um, what happened and, and that you don't hold it against this defendant that he wanted to be uh, remain silent and, and of course he has a constitutional right to do it. and the detective is agreeing with the defense counsel on all of that. Um, it really seems to me that if you accept the notion that it is possible to cure a problem like this at trial Defense counsel went a long way to do that, to help cure it. And to me, I couple that with no request for a curative instruction at the end of the thing, and it seems like the problem gets solved. Well, I, I just don't agree. A, a jury sat there and listened to this. <laughs> you know, listened to this officer testify about the guy's body language as slumping down. I mean, what do guilty people do when they're confronted with an accusation? They slump. No, I agree. Uh, they I, look away. I um, can agree and, with that. I'm just... But, you know, and, but, and, and, I, and I know defense counsel, try, he tried to, to jump in there and fix it the best he could after his, after his request that should have been granted was denied. You kind of go, what, well, what do I do now? You know? I mean, the record may be a little more clean to appeal, but I got a trial I'm trying to win. I, and and I've, asked, I've asked for my remedy, and I didn't get it. Um, and the judge has invited me, uh, you know, and I... And, I, I, and if defense counsel had have asked for uh, a curative instruction, then we would be saying, well, the defense got what it wanted. They got it cured when it raised the mistrial issue. Yes. So, and, 
you know and i and i think we back up to galloway at least there there was some of that that the court hung its hat on in finding that that was not an error you're this you're pretty much out of time but in maybe a minute or less can you you uh are arguing for um a lack of a unanimity instruction is one error and a violation of an order in limine or an improper denial of a mistrial however that's characterized in, in the other issue um what's your argument for cumulative error well that we simply add those two up and if in isolation there may be a a belief that i, I know this courts sometimes isolate issues and isolate the prejudice impact analysis and may say there's not enough prejudice here from this error um, and i think if we combine those two uh, aspects of this case the error is cumulative and at, at the time i made that argument i also included of course number one um, which is not issue number one which isn't a good issue for us at this point so that's simply to avoid the isolated prejudicial impact analysis that occurs sometimes. Are there any other questions? Any more questions? Council. Thank you, Council. Thank you. May it please the court, Molly Hill, Assistant District Attorney, Wyandotte County, appears on behalf of the state. Um, I would just uh, like to touch briefly on issue one um, regarding the alternative means. I do ad admit that there has been case law that has decided that issue, and I should have submitted a Rule 609 letter, and I, I do apologize uh, for not doing so. I will submit one. Um, however, I believe that uh, State v. Brown, as the uh, appellant uh, mentioned, has decided that particular issue. Um, with respect for issue two, uh, regarding uh, the district court failing to give a unanimity instruction, and it, the state admits that uh, the prosecutor did not elect in argument either which particular act. Um, Which brings me to a question. Yes. We've said that the prosecutor has to elect uh, which of the acts it's proceeding under, or there's... Uh, an instruction. Um, if the prosecutor doesn't elect, why are we requiring the defense to jump the hurdle of clearly erroneous when it's been the prosecutor's error, in addition to the defense error not, not to request it? You understand what I'm saying? Why isn't this a little different than the normal uh, failure to request instruction when it could, when that error could have been cured by the prosecutor, uh, Justice, I guess I would just say I think um, at the time that this case uh, was being tried, I don't believe that um, the prior the, the cases had come out saying that you either had to elect or a unanimity instruction um, was required. What what year was it? Um, I believe it was in two thousand nine. I believe. Okay. Um, I think you may be incorrect about that. Okay, <laughs> then I then I apologize. I th I admit that there was error. Um, the prosecutor should have asked for unanimity instruction, or the uh, it should have. However, I guess the state's argument is that there was um, sufficient evidence, and I, I think um, what's, what's strange to me, Counselor, is is we have the jury pointing it out. You know and. And at that particular point, the answer should have been in the form of a unanimity instruction. And I do agree that there should have been an instruction. However, I guess with respect to the jury's question, they didn't ask just, they uh, didn't want to have read back regarding the timing of the um, acts. They didn't. Um, they didn't care when the time, when the acts occurred, just specifically the specific acts, and uh, there well, was sufficient evidence. Their question wasn't about the specific acts; it was confusion as to why there were three counts charged and only or two counts charged and evidence of three, and then they also specified I think there were two rape charges and evidence of 
more than that. I can't remember how many there are. Eight, yeah, which is pretty significant, and nobody helped them out. Nobody said, well, yeah, and you need to be unanimous as to whatever act you select. And then they acquit on the two rape charges. So we really don't have any idea, do we, what they were thinking or whether they thought, well, if, if there was evidence of two, then, you know, that's good enough. Or if there's evidence, you know, that they, we just don't know. And, and that's a problem, knowing that they were confused. Well, I think the issue is either they believe the testimony of victim ST or not, the same way they either believe the testimony of SS in totality or not. Well, why it, would they have asked then about the two rape charges versus the eight uh, different uh, charges that there was evidence or eight different acts or evidence of? Why would they have bothered to ask about that if they only believed that there were, you know, that they weren't going to believe that testimony at all? They wanted to know how they were supposed to handle this evidence. I guess, um, I guess I would argue the reverse, the, the, in fa the fact that, um, the fact that they acqu acquitted on the two rape counts that perhaps they didn't know about unanimity or they weren't sure and that that was the reason why they decided it. However, I would still argue that there was consistent evidence and strong evidence r with respect to ST, that it was consistent not only through her testimony, but the testimony of the other witnesses who corroborated. Was SS's uh, or ST's uh, uh, testimony or SS's testimony consistent? I don't believe it was, and I don't believe that there was any other corroboration by any of the other witnesses. In fact, ST was asked regarding SS's disclosure, and she, uh, ST testified that she had no knowledge of it, had not told anyone else about uh, that particular aspect as well. There was also testimony that there were, there were other, there was at least one other child in the room at the times these, these events occurred, correct? On one of the instances, yes, that there was a, she testified that there was a, uh, a young friend, I believe, that was younger than her at the time. And that was, that was SS there. or ST? It, that was ST. That's what I thought. Okay, so the the story might have sounded a little more incredible to a jury that that kind of behavior could have occurred while another child was right there and that child be unaware. But ST was the one that was fondled, right? That's correct. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that, and that was, Sorry, I got him backwards for oh, a second. That's Thanks. okay. Um, if there aren't... Uh, any other questions with this particular issue? I guess I would just remain on my uh, on my brief with respect to that issue. With respect to uh, the third issue, um, I know uh, I, the state's argument, I guess, is that uh, it was invited error. It was that the detective, although before we go there, yeah. do you agree it's a Doyle violation? I believe yes that the detective did comment. I I agree with that. However, I believe that. Um, when the defense asked for a mistrial and it was denied, there were other things that could have been done that they could have asked for a limiting instruction. And I believe to a certain extent that the defense, based on the continued questioning and and um, the detective agreeing that... Now, explain to me when the prosecutor's witness commits a Doyle violation in, viola in direct violation of an order in limine, why is it the defense's obligation to cure that error? When the state has an obligation to advise its witnesses of limine orders, would you agree with that? Yes, I would agree. And your witness violated that limine order. Why is it that the defense has to take on the uh, responsibility of curing that error? Well, I guess because it was in response to a question that the defense asked. Well, well, that doesn't... It wasn't responsive, though. Yeah, it, first it wasn't responsive. And, and does the fact that the, he, under cross-examination doesn't give free license to ignore uh, Doyle, Doyle, which this witness clearly knows about. He's a trained detective, testified in court before, knows exactly the parameters of what uh, he's allowed to testify to. Plus there's a, an order in limine. It doesn't give free license just to, because he's under cross-examination, to ignore those orders, does it? 
no i don't i don't believe so yeah that and that's the point is is that what justice johnson was saying is and why is it up to defense counsel to cure just because he's subject to cross examination well i will say uh, with respect i don't believe the state brought any other attention to that particular right. issue they did not ask any further questions it was not mentioned in any argument and um i believe so basically what you're saying is kind of a harmless analysis once we're past that. I believe so, yes. And I uh, also uh, believe that further evidence of that is the fact that um, it, it didn't completely prejudice uh, the defendant and the fact that the jury was able to acquit on the two counts with the other witness. I believe that uh, the testimony of ST was consistent, it was corroborated by other witnesses, and it was sufficient to overcome any prejudice of the Doyle violation. Um, if there aren't uh, any other questions, then I would just uh, submit on my brief. I, I would ask with, uh, with regard to the defense question, it was uh, in relation to the probable cause affidavit, wasn't it? It, it was correct. And, well, not and, only and you would agree that the defendant's invocation of Miranda or, or right to remain silent has no bearing on the question of probable cause. In other words, the detective could not use defendant's silence to establish, uh, 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 to make a probable cause affidavit. Would you agree with that? I would agree that it it's not the the defendant's silence it could not be the basis of probable cause. I agree with that. It's not but, even relevant. It has nothing to do with probable cause. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that. However, I do believe that it was part of the, that statement was part of the affidavit. Right or wrong, it, it was contained in it, and I think defense counsel went so far as to ask the de, uh, the witness to read what was in the affidavit, and that's why it was further brought up because he was um, at that point in response to a direct question. Uh, by the defense counsel. Counsel, uh, since I gather you've tried cases during your career, and if you receive an answer to a question that you've posed and you feel that the answer is non-responsive to your question, what do you do? I would ask uh, to have the judge instruct uh, the witness to respond to the questions. Um, and is there also a technique that you can use to move that the answer be stricken? Yes, and I, some, uh, you could also ask that the court admonish the witness, ask the jury to uh, admonish the jury as well and tell them to please disregard um, that question as well. I do agree that sometimes when you ask the jury to do that, you're drawing more attention to it as well. But I do believe that there are other things that could be done. Perhaps the prosecutor could have even themselves, uh, it was not myself that was on that particular case, but could have asked that there be an admonishment as well. However, I do believe that the evidence was sufficient. There was strong evidence and consistent evidence uh, by the witness, the victim, ST, um, that overcame any prejudice of the Doyle violation. And as I understand it, opposing counsel is relying in part on counsel's failure to do that as some evidence of prosecutorial misconduct. This was all cooked up before Detective Hudson took the stand. Is that correct? As far as, I do believe that they are um, mentioning that. However, I don't believe that <laughs> that was the case based on my review of the record. Based on, and I think there's further evidence of the fact that the state made no mention of this comment, did not on redirect, did not ask any questions of it, and made no mention of it during uh, closing argument as well. All right, thank you. Any thank further you. questions of counsel? Thank you. Right, thank you. You reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. And I think what I'd like to, um, I'd like to clarify, I'm not arguing that, that the state and Hudson cooked this up. I think Hudson did it on his own, or either, either the state did not tell Hudson about the order in Lemony, or it did tell Hudson about the order in Lemony, and Hudson ignored it on his own. And, and my argument as to prosecutorial misconduct is based on the premise that Hudson and the state are joined. 
that they are one for that analysis and if there had been a failure by the prosecutor to inform detective hudson of this order in lemony would in your estimation that be some evidence of misconduct by the prosecutor yes it would thank you any further questions any further presentation no thank you thank you counsel thank you both for the arguments this morning take this matter under advisement